Hi guys, welcome. A few people are turning up. Give it another 30 seconds and start talking about black swans. Um, I thought this was a really topical cartoon from uh, Michael Mittag. And by the way, do jump in the chat if you can't hear me or uh, what's going on, but I should be in theory. I should be live at the moment. So yeah, so this cartoon from Michael Mittag from Cool Risk, he goes back probably about 10 years ago. I used it in a, a book a little while ago, but I thought given the current pandemic, it's kind of a, uh, a pertinent little way of looking at the world. So where are we? 12.30. Let me blather about black swans for a moment. Let's give people a minute to get in in case they're having IT problems. So I think most of you probably know I'm Julian Talbot. I write books about risk management and I consult on risk and I, I like risk um, and somehow it just sort of came, came together that that's, I get to make a living doing the fun stuff that I enjoy. And one of my pet peeves is black swans. Now, I should uh, jump into that and say, look, part of the idea of black swans reflects in my, um, in this quote from one of my favourite movies, Fight Club, and it's simply, you know, on a long enough timeline, everything's going to happen. Everyone's going to die on a long enough timeline something's going to happen. And this whole idea of black swans is predicated on the unexpected. So I'm glad there's so many turned up. There's more. There's like 120 registered and about 30 of you here so far. So thank you. I know some of you are in places where it's very dark in the middle of the night on the other side of the planet. So thanks. And as per a couple of emails, just I'll do my best to keep you awake and try and, try and make it a bit of fun. It's, if it's any consolation here in Canberra today, it's a very grey day. So but not quite as dark. It's about midday here. So let me first say, look, I have nothing against Cygnus atratus. I actually love black swans. The black swan, the water bird, fantastic. I, I can see them from the balcony here as I look out and as we walk around Lake Burley Griffin, there's any number of them. They're not the black swans I'm talking about making extinct. They're uh, a different type of black swan. The... Uh, uh, and I'm not very shot at Nassim Taleb either. I love his books. So I really enjoy reading them and I enjoy his, his thought processes. And I actually think Black Swan as an idea is a really useful addition to our vocab and the way we think about risks. So I'm, I'm having a bit of a, a tongue in cheek shot here. But, but in reality, I do think we need to make them extinct. I think it's lazy thinking. Um, Taleb has said basically his essay is a, about our single idea, the blindness with respect to randomness, particularly large deviations, as in high volatility or things we don't expect. And I think that gets to the heart of this idea of our blind spots, because, you know, what's a blind spot for one person is a really obvious thing for another. So before I get into shooting down, uh, you know, taking a shotgun to the proverbial black swans, let me have a quick talk about it. So we're all on the same page. So black swan has three ideas that it's extremely rare, it has a severe impact and it's only predictable in hindsight. So, you know, I, I think I, I'm going to disagree with that vote and argue that case very strongly why I think none of this is true and there's no such thing as a bloody black swan, okay? So let me give you some examples about black swan, which and this is Wikipedia talking about uh, Taleb's book and other people's definitions of black swans. So they're talking about uh, saying these are classic examples of black swans, okay? Major scientific discoveries, historical events, artistic accomplishments, the rise of the internet, personal computer, World War I, dissolution of the Soviet Union, the September 11 attacks. So I'm going to start with a couple of things here that, you know, the personal computer, yes, there were a few people who didn't see that coming. But when you look at the people who did see it coming, to many people it was very obvious. And I'm going to argue the dissolution of the Soviet Union is not a black swan. Most of Western Europe and the United States and half the world have been working for years to try and dissolve the, the Soviet Union. So it wasn't as if this was something out of the blue. This was something we actually constructed and worked towards creating. And then suddenly everyone goes, oh, it's a black swan. That was unexpected. Well, no, that's risk management. We were trying to manage the risk. We were actively trying to dissolve the Soviet Union. The September 11 attacks as well, you know, they're often referred to as a black swan. I'm, come to some examples of that, but fundamentally, you know, we know people have been hijacking planes for years. We know people have been in suicide attacks, not just suicide vests, but, you know, sort of like truck bombs and all sorts of things, even flying planes 
into buildings in 1936, I think it was. There was a, uh, a World War II era bomber flew into the side of the Empire State Building in a fog. So, you know, we've got this whole chain of events that says none of this is really should come out of the blue. But what do we do about it? So this is, this is what the whole point of the webinar is, right? Um, <laughs> what do we actually do to improve it? And I'll jump into the chat here to see. I think I've got someone's got a comment there. Oh, hello. A few people saying hi. All good and loud and clear. Thank you very much. Um, I'll come to some questions in the end. Uh, but let me just talk first of all about this. This is a, it's not a very good picture, I'll grant you, okay? But it's the North Earth Shelf Gas Project in Karratha. It's a photo that I took, so I can use it royalty free and I can sort of brag about it. So my point is here that I worked at this gas plant for a number of years. I was the manager of security and emergency there. Came back as a consultant to do a few jobs. And one of those jobs that I came back as a consultant was in early 2001, was to do a security risk assessment. The first, you know, in 20 years of operation, they had a few security reviews, but this was the first enterprise level security risk assessment, looking at the offshore rigs. There's a point to the story, by the way, but it, it's a set in a beautiful part of the world, I think, where the ocean meets the desert. Part of the, the job of doing this security risk assessment was to obviously look at all the risks and improvements and what have you. But when I looked at it partly with my security background and my military background, and you know, this it's 230 hectares, which is 500 acres for you know, people using the old money. It's got a couple of outlying facilities apart from the rigs, but basically it's a 500 acre potty of pipes, gas tanks, uh, a couple of jetties, the usual sort of administration buildings, the sort of thing you'd expect when you are producing natural gas and, and oil. And when you look at it from a point of view of defence, about 60% of it is facing the water. I mean, like right on the water. The fence goes to the water and you could you could turn up with a rowboat, basically, and you could climb the fence and you're in the plant. And you, the reason I picked this picture of it is to show you could climb a hill. You could walk uphill, drive, in fact, up a hill right next to it and have complete oversight with a high-powered rifle or with a, a shoulder launch device. Um, bear in mind, none of this, this was before 9-11. So, you know, when I look at this idea of standing here with a man pad, shoulder launch missile or RPGs lobbing into these gas tanks, um, the idea is pretty far-fetched and fanciful. But it was part of the suite of risks that I looked at, and, you know, the whole bunch of other risk environmental demonstrations and things going breaking down and petty theft were all in there. But when I looked at this risk and said, okay, what would we do if we were facing a military or a terrorist threat? And and again, it was pretty far-fetched in that area. So I won't say it was far-fetched to me, but it was far-fetched to the management team. So they were like, yeah, yeah, you know, we're never going to face that. So my bottom line was we couldn't resolve that with our own resources. You know, if it was a military threat, we would need Australian military to defend it. Uh, if it was terrorist threat, similarly, it was a military. And we had a, a range of other processes in place. And then 9-11 happened. And then suddenly, and I was working at this point as an employee in a different job there. And the client that I, you know, my boss there that I'd done the review for was called into the, the manager's office, the senior management meeting. He said, what are we going to do? 9-11 stack, we need to change posture. And he very calmly said, no, you don't. Here's the security review. It's all in there. Here's what we would do if, and it involved upgrading CCTV and upgrading liaison with the um, defence force, and upgrade, a whole range of upgrades to you know, getting people to safe, including having call op contracts. So this is part of what I'm saying to us as risk managers, and, and it doesn't matter if you're talking financial risk, you know, global financial crisis, or you're talking any sort of a, a risk issue, is to think about the worst case scenario and have something in there, have something in your risk assessment and your process so that it's not a matter of reinventing it and we go, you know, 9-11 was not a black swan in, in the world of security practitioners. A lot of people have been thinking about these things. But it was actually having that solution and then say, this is all we do. These are the steps we take. We already know what we're going to do. We don't need to rewrite this. We don't need to revisit it. It's been thought about. So I'll get into the nitty gritty of a few more ideas. So basically, there are a couple of things which we can do. One of them I like is the all hazards approach. And, and that simply says, look, you know, when 9-11 happened, we didn't have to go and create a whole carter of firefighters and ambulance officers and police because we already have an approach to managing risk, you know, just as we have insurance and we have contingency and, and we all have all sorts of things in place. Another topic I'm going to talk about is 
probability distributions, thinking about what's the range of possibilities. And then crazy ideas. So, and for example, to think about crazy ideas, if we were to think about the most outrageous risk, you know, the, the biggest black swan of all you can imagine. So what is that? I mean, I, I don't know. I read science fiction. Most of it's in there. Could the earth be destroyed by a piece of um, antimatter at any point? Could the moon split in half and cause the end of uh, the world as a Seven Eves, a book by Neil Stevenson recently proposed? All of these things can happen. And it's just about having the craziest ideas and accepting God. It doesn't matter whether it's antimatter or dark matter or alien invasion. A long enough time frame, these are all risks which we need to think about what would we do if, whatever the source is, what would we do? And then, of course, there's a reality check because, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to build a meteorite-proof structure over the top of my roof on the off chance it's going to land here tomorrow. It's not a risk that I can care about, but it's not a black swan either. You know, we know at some point, when well, we know regularly the planet is taken, attacked by meteors and, and all sorts of space debris. So th let's frame it in another point of view. This is a Stroud matrix, and this is one of the tools that I use. I'm going to bag risk matrices, or I've got a book on risk matrices coming out soon, and I've got a lot of bad things to say about risk matrices, but I have a lot of good things to say about them and how they'd be used. And one of them is as a discussion tool. So this Stroud matrix is a really simple idea of a model about discussing risk and how we look at it. So the business as usual, are all those little unlikely and minor things, you know, things like tools will get lost, Computers will fail, you know, you'll lose all sorts of, you know, maybe you'll lose a file or be corrupted, you know, something will break at work. These are these kind of routine things, or not in routine, BAU, business as usual. And then you have the routine, which in this example is fraud, but I mean, routine is also things like, you know, doors will stop working. Um, you'll get a, a leak in the warehouse roof, which will damage some stock. These are all likely, but they're not big deals, they're not huge risks. And up in this sort of right-hand quadrant, I've got this idea of a danger zone, which is very likely to happen, and they'd be very significant if that something does happen to us. So a cyber attack is something in that space. And, and my concept with this Stroud matrix is that if it's in the danger zone, you should be already doing something about it. You know, <laughs> whatever it is, you should have got to get that the hell out of there and let's do something as a, a really urgent priority. So I've got swans in this case, in this bottom right. So they're unlikely events, but they're major. So they're all the things in your organisation, in your life, in your business, um, that are things that, you know, maybe in a personal space, that's coming down with a, a major disease. In a business space, maybe that's something like having some sort of a, um, well, I say catastrophic mechanical failure or a new product line fails, or you have some sort of a industrial accident which causes a series of injuries, you know, and SO Longford, for example, where a gas plant had an explosion and failed in Melbourne. So these are all the things in there. And I've just called them swans, not black swans, because there are white swans, which are the bleeding obvious ones we know about okay, in the in the swan model. But there's also grey swans and green swans and blue swans and all manner of swans we haven't anticipated. So we may all go to somewhere in the Amazon and discover there's a blue swan. I don't know. We may go to a different planet and discover the new species of swans. But the point is, these are all things which are in that unlikely but major. And that's kind of the topic of what I'm trying to address with this you know, extinction event for black swans. So part of the process in terms of looking at this is this ISO 31000 process. And you can relax. I'm not going to do an ISO 31000 process webinar here today. That's a different webinar. It's just up there as a reminder to say this is a logical sequence, a logical process of steps which we can apply as part of taking out black swans, finding them, um, I want to say killing black swans, let's just say finding them and mitigating those risks, shall we? Uh, so let's have a talk about risk analysis in this context of inherent, current and residual risk. And I'll talk about a simple view of risk. First of all, you can look at this risk matrix as a way of explaining here's terrorism, cost management, capability management, you know, so capability in the context of an organisation saying maybe we can or can't get staff. So that's a low risk, but it's the largest impact. So, you know, or the largest, most likely risk. So you change the colour to identify it. You can change the size of that risk bubble to indicate the level of uncertainty around it. So it's a 
the larger the risk bubble, the larger the uncertainty. And so here's, here's an example of using a risk matrix to think about conveying information. So if you think about this risk here, which is looking at, it starts up here, it's been a moderate risk. And I'm gonna take this with a pinch of salt. I'm using risk matrix here as a communication tool, not as an analysis tool. Okay, so just to be very clear, and I'll come to the limitations later very quickly. But you can use this to indicate risk if it's inherent and we treat it down to here. And if we spend a little bit more money, we get it down to there. And if we spend ridiculous amounts of money, we can make this an, an almost irrelevant risk. So everything in this, and I'll, I'll put this up online as a video so you can pause it and have a look at it later and, and the various elements of it because it's, I don't want to get bogged down in the details. But essentially what I'm saying here is this is a, a really useful communication tool to be able to say, okay, so, you know, order of magnitude for costs to get it down from one area. Are we talking about a high, medium or low? You know, how volatile is it? How rapidly can it change? So they're just using different shapes. The confidence interval. So, you know, if it's a larger area, we, we don't really have as much of a bigger confidence about exactly the rating for this risk. So if we had something which covered most of that risk matrix, we're basically saying, I have no idea um, how risky it is. I don't know how likely it is. I don't know how um, big the impact will be. But let me leave you with that and move on to a couple of other areas. Now here's part of the problem with black swans is that we try to think of risks in the idea that there's a point value. If someone slips on the floor, we can say it's X, you know, it's possible and it's negligible. And this risk matrix, we said, this is this is the risk. This is the reality. And it's not the reality of the risk because risks are not that simple. And I've seen risk assessments where people have rated risks to two or three decimal places. And I'm just thinking, okay. So when I say to my boss, um, one of my clients, and they say, so, so is it going to rain tomorrow? I said, oh, I think it's about a 1% chance of rain. And they, I come in, I see them that afternoon, they're dripping wet and they blame me. And I say, well, that was the 1%. Now, this is the uncertainty of risk management. So it's about thinking about how do we deal with it if we're not able to actually address it. So, you know, let's think about this idea, this slip, trips and hazard, all the things that have happened. Now, in the mix, you've got death and injury and fractures and bruising. In a simple example, to play around with the risk matrix here, let's say that it is, you know, this is what we think, this is what we decided, to, and, and again, I'm using this for illustration, not for analysis, but let's play around with it. So we know, you know, that's really pretty notional, a bit useless, really, in the scheme of things. We know, what do you do with that? You think it's probable someone's going to bruise himself if they slip on a water leak somewhere. So let's have a think about what could actually happen. You've got water on the floor. Someone walks in, slips on it. There's a whole range of possible outcomes. You know, is it, and, and again, this is this black swan idea. There's a whole range of possible outcomes of an aircraft being hijacked, a whole range of possible outcomes of a new technology being invented. You know, we've, we're dealing with now with the risk of artificial intelligence, trying to anticipate how will we manage it? You know, will it, will it take over the world and will it create the Terminator scenario or will it create paradise as we've never known before? You know, these are all the things which we can anticipate and, and some that we can't fully but we can broadly anticipate the direction the way things are going with enough thought. There are people there whose entire job it is to think about this category of risks. Now, just because I don't know doesn't mean there aren't a heck of a lot of people who actually do know. So think about this slips, trips and falls and a range of possible outcomes. You know, you might trip over and have no injury at all and you know, just pick yourself up and go on. You might bruise, you might break an arm, you might end up in hospital, you might even die. How likely all that is, we don't know. So, so what do we do? How do we model it? So I'm going to give you a scenario to imagine. We've, we're going to look at this idea of a, a bridge. This is a really simple risk and it's really easy to model. I like simple risk and I like things that are easy to model because that's what we're trying to do here. Now imagine this is in a very cold climate, so it's wet and it's icy and it's rainy and we think about, okay, so let's have a think about this bridge in the context and I'll, there's a reason why I want to separate these out. So inherent current and residual risk. So this inherent risk is the idea if we had no controls, what would happen? If the, the current risk as it is today with the existing controls, whatever they may be, and the residual risk, we're trying to say, okay, well, what's our risk appetite, you know? 
how many people would we allow to die or you know how how would our reputation as a local council responsible for this bridge what would be acceptable so what do we need to know and this is this is the big question um, there's a couple of great books on this how to measure every measure anything uh, yeah, I think it's titled by Douglas Hubbard he's written a lot on this topic a few other people have as well but the fundamental question is if we want to assess risk what is it what information do we have and what do we not have? So let's sort of start and think about, okay, so what's the source of this risk? You know, where is it coming from? In this case, it's water, it's ice, it's, you know, it's nature. So we can, we can narrow it down. This is about scoping. What assets do we care about? In this case, it's going to be people. You know, they're our resource. They're our um, key risk. Um, where are we? So how many people are going to be using the bridge? If it only gets used once every 10 years, that's a different kettle of fish from 100 people an hour going across it to go to work. So what's the likelihood and what's the consequence? You know, what are the range of possible uh, eventual outcomes and the individual likelihoods? And think about, ultimately, what's our objectives here? What are we trying to achieve? So what are, we, what are all these things we need to know? We need to have an understanding. And often we don't, sometimes we don't have the data, sometimes, you know, if we're, if we're looking at the law of large numbers with insurance claims and we have a 20 people fall off this bridge in the last year, then we've probably got a good data set in a really bad way. But let's imagine we, we don't have quite that simpler data set. So what do we do? How do we figure it out? Well, we turn around to our pool of uh, trusty volunteers and we, uh, we get a big budget and we hire 10 stunt people, different shapes and sizes, heights, widths, all the, all the bits and pieces. And we wrap them up in padding and felt protection. We just push them onto the bridge. We say, okay, okay. So we'll get it. we're going to get a data set, right? So we've got all sorts of sensors in there designed to be able to track when they fall, how hard they hit. Um, and we have medical experts then look at what this means. And we have some um, idea of the impact, the consequence. We can assess likelihood based on how often they fall. And I'm not proposing you do this, okay? It's a very dull experiment. Actually, it could be a fun experiment. You know, it could be a lot of fun, but yeah, bags not being one of the stunt people. So if we look at the whole different types of speeds, you put different shoes on them, you know, we give them hiking boots with ice cleats on them. We give them ballet shoes and thongs and slippers. And we, send them. we get an idea what different people wear and what they do. And then we start looking at, you know, how they work. We imagine we take the handrails off, we're going to say someone... If people hit the edge with a handrail, then we call that falling off the bridge because you know we like our stunt people and we need to keep pushing them across again. So, so if we break too many of them, we won't get much data set because they'll all quit. So it's just imagine hitting the handrails is is the process, and whether we do another hundred crossings where they can use the handrail, and then we do a hundred crossings again where we put a non-slip surface, we put gravel down. So that's if you like simulating our inherent risk our current risk with handrails and our notional risk if we do this proposed treatment. So, and there is a point again to this story and hopefully it makes sense in the context. So if you extrapolate this to whether it's financial risks or operational risks, but just to have a think about what we're doing here in terms of this. Now, this again is just about presenting information, not analyzing. I'm not proposing that we get a risk matrix and go, yes, it's X, why and we'll get our group of experts in the room to dream up some numbers. We're actually using real data from real stunt people who are by now black and blue and bruised and are probably on workers' compensation, but we make some assumptions, okay? So the bridge is always wet and it's icy. We consider on our risk matrix of consequence, existential risk is one or more deaths, whatever. You could call it 100 deaths. You know, if you were in the military, you'd probably, in World War II, you probably would have called an existential threat about the size of a battalion, but that's we're not, we're in, we're in Sweden, let's say we're in Sweden or we're uh, somewhere where the legislative environment's pretty strong. So one death is a bad thing. Time frame's one year. We have a frequency. We know a thousand people a year use it. So a thousand people there. Fantastic. So we model this idea of a hundred people across the bridge. We look at the current risk. This is how many people, stunt people fell over and you can see the distribution of how injured they were in this notional study. We look at the inherent risk and we say, okay, so, you know, what, what does that look like? So up here, if there are no guardrails and nothing to hold on to on this icy bridge, you know, we've killed 
two people and you know majorly injured pretty much everybody really one way or another and then we look at this sort of residual idea of putting a non-slip surface on there and we think okay so now what are we talking about in terms of all hazards and what are we talking about in terms of presenting and analyzing data we're looking at this different model we're looking at something we say okay we're no longer saying a slip trip and fall is a point and shoot value and we're no longer saying that this range of outcomes oh i never thought someone could fall to their death on it um, because we modeled it we've looked at it and we've said okay this is this worst case scenario and I'm, it's kind of this bridge is a bit more dangerous than i'd like to think it was in real life but you know it's it's a it's a model but how do we then present risks in ways which make sense so but I argue there's a better matrix where you start to think about likelihood being zero to one. That's a probability, that's, that's basic maths, right? So we don't get more likely than guaranteed. But consequence of zero to one, whatever your existential threat is. So if it's the entire budget of your organization, or it's the loss of your platoon in a military scenario, or it's you know whatever you consider one risk to be. And then you start modeling these not as a point, but as a probability distribution. Because what you see there is very quickly in this model, you know, risk A is pretty benign, but risk C and risk D are actually, you know, they're, they're right out there. They're kind of out off the Richter scale in terms of they're going to start killing a lot of people. Half the people with risk D, whatever it is, you know, essentially it's anything in that category is, is starting to become your black swan, starting to become really anticipated. This is a bad risk. So I won't bore you with this, you get the general idea, you know, risk is, is about what's the likelihood and consequence, what does it look like, map it. And, and yes, you can have, I want to talk about, a, again, this idea of the black swan. Risk C is a double dip, you know, it's the, the camel with two humps, okay? And people might say, well, what, how can you have this sort of probability distribution? Well, it's, it's a little bit around contingency. So let's say you are building a new submarine you might say that the cost is likely to be, or the cost you know, overrun is likely to be this, and that would be the left-hand side of this curve. So we're looking at this kind of an area. Let me draw this. Uh, this part of it is where we think our cost will be. We can even do some analysis and say, well, you know, this part is starting to get unacceptable. So we have to think about how we manage our project risks and that. But what happens here? This is the part where we've actually had the discussion instead of just going to our bosses or our politicians saying, no problem, we've got a great submarine, we can bring this in on time and on budget, which of course is what we all want to say. We might say, well, if you choose to not go with the Swedish one or choose to not extend the existing Collins class, then that introduces a whole new kettle of risk and the cost will almost certainly blow out. So this is, if you like, contingent and you might make an assessment about how likely it is that that will become part of it. If you're looking at four options, as we were in Australia with the submarine project, one of the least likely ones turned out to be the one we chose and we went with a whole new model and a whole new class. So unsurprisingly, our cost overrun turned out to be this end of the scale. But that was entirely anticipatable. It was entirely something that we could model and understand. So to have a look at that in another area, let's have a look at how do you get to this? And I'll give you an example of this. This is a a kind of concept that I've used before this um, consequence, asset, sources, and events. So once you have that idea, you can work out a likelihood and you can work out some you know range of consequences. But this concept of saying, um, what are the four things we can worry about here? So what what its impact on objectives? What assets or resources do we care about? We know what are critical to us or likely vulnerable. What are the sources of risk we care about? You can come up with a list of each of these. You can come up with risk events, everything from fire to theft to fraud to financial market collapse. You can do all those in a list. But getting away from that, or in terms of applying it, you start to think about this causal chain. And this is where a lot of the risk thinking I'm going with at the moment is in terms of what's the causal chain that's leading to this? And I, I don't want to point and shoot three decimal point accuracy risk, right? I actually want to think about what can I do in the scheme of things in a Swiss cheese model to make sure that it's, it doesn't happen or it's so unlikely, or if it does happen, and again, looking at this in terms of 
likelihood versus consequence management, we're thinking, think about classic uh, a meteorite strike or a bit of dark matter, antimatter hitting the earth, creating massive disruption, earthquakes, whatever you want to call it. Um, not a lot we can do about likelihood, right? And so we can't really break that causal chain of a meteorite strike, not yet. Give it, give it time. I know people are working on it. And when we're on Mars, there'll probably be a few Martians who don't care what happens on planet Earth with the meteorites. But, um, but right now I'm a bit concerned that we should have some sort of a plan in place. So this is this idea of escalation factors and escalation barriers. And a little bit with bushfires, for example, there's a certain amount we can do to prevent bushfires. There's not a heck of a lot if we have a, a super drought or we have the conditions we had a year and a half ago when basically any spark turned into a, a you know, thousand acres of fire. But if you think about, and, that, and, and rest assured again, take a deep breath, this is not a, a webinar about bow tie theory and bow tie tables. I just want to illustrate the idea. Because when you start to think about this case, CASE, the consequent asset source and event, you start to think about, okay, well, how does that relate? What are all the possibilities that you might come up with? So you might think about um, an example of a network breach and keep it simple. You, you could have 100 risk events you cared about here, okay? So I'm just, I'm just trying to illustrate how you might mix and match some tables into it. And I'll show you another example in a minute. But right now, we're really looking at this idea of, let's say, pathway number one, a state actor. So foreign intelligence service causes a network breach looking at your operations data, um, what's the consequence, lost sales, profit is the profit to the impact on objectives. So when you start modeling these in a herringbone or a root cause analysis or a, a tack tree, you start to come up with all sorts of possibilities. Now, some of them are ludicrous, okay? So terrorists are not gonna steal your building. They're probably not gonna steal your stationery either. But Likewise, petty criminals are not going to blow up your service station or put a truck bomb underneath your car park. So, so you can eliminate some of these ideas. But equally, some of them will be a little you know, thought provoking. Some of them will cause you to think, and OK, would I, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, in my mind, I, I look at it, if someone goes to their boss and says, sorry, boss, it was a black swan. I'm just like, well, you know, you really didn't think this through or you, you listen to the group think so. Uh, and any number of examples of groupthink, which I won't go into now because some of them are just kind of tragic events, but we all know what we mean by that. So here's my rule of thumb. Don't worry about this black swan idea. If you treat the top 10 risk, you are going to address most significant risk and you're going to have an all hazards approach. If you think about this idea of the objectives are comprehensive and defensible and prioritized, and I mean prioritized in the sense here, you can't treat everything. You know, I remember coming into a job, I'll, I won't say where, but I, I inherited some uh, risk registers and risk treatments, some of which were like, uh, put put some CCTV in the CEO's garden shed so nobody steals the lawnmower. I'm like, okay, it's on the risk register and I can't ignore it. And there were a couple others a little more real. I can't ignore them, but I can prioritize them. I can say, okay, until I do my next risk assessment, I take off the whole CCTV and the lawn lock. So I don't have to worry about that and waste resources and money on it. I'm just gonna move that down the list and I'm gonna work my way through it. So that's that's a strategic way of thinking about how to address them. So move away from it and start thinking about all these possible sources of risk, all the possible events could happen. You end up 300 odd risks, let's say for a single enterprise security risk assessment. If you're doing an enterprise risk assessment that's covering not just security, but finance and safety and procurement and supply chain, you might end up with a thousand risks by doing the same model. Okay, so there's just an example. If you think about rolling them up, aggregating them, and then you know you, where you are, the location, and the facilities, and the situation will vary a bit, but you might end up with this whole aggregated risk, which should be less than 50. So this is a rule of thumb. Okay, so. I'm not, do not go to your boss and say, Julian Talbot said, only 50 risks or exactly 50 risks on the risk register, please. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying this is a rule of thumb. If you start with a lot of risk, you should, you, you want to get them down to something in the space of about 20 to 50, maybe 30 to 50, and then just look at the top 10. In the context of this all hazards approach, of course. So, to, just to model what I'm talking about and give you an idea, here's, here's a notional kind of concept. You just start with a table. Just 
roll all these things up and say, okay, all the things could possibly go wrong. What are all the consequences that I care about? My reputation, my costs, you know, what? And, and these are all in the context of objectives. Okay, so not, I don't really exist alone. If you, if you, I hope we're all on the same page there. We look at the assets that we care about, whether it's information, people, we look at the sources of um, crime. This is a really, you know, just doing a simple example of a service station looking at security risks. Same principle applies. Some of these, when you join together, they won't make sense. Again, cyber criminals are not going to go along and do an armed robbery. Okay, that's not their, not their whole MO, that won't happen. But when you start looking at linking all the things that could impact each other, you start to see swans walking around. I don't quack, but you know, swans. Whatever sound, the honking noise that swans make is coming loud and clear, it should by this point. So you're starting to see, okay, so what's the likelihood of this event playing out? You know, We've got the um, three ways of looking at risk. And this is one of the things that I look at, these three laws of the laws of the land, law of the jungle, law of large numbers. So law of large numbers, if you've got some good historical data. Insurance is an example. Cybersecurity is a classic because you can tell how often your network is getting hit. You know, you've got logs about how many attacks or attempts are happening there. You've got data in the, in the broader world that's being reported to governments about how many uh, hacker groups there are out there, what the latest techniques are, uh, how it's working. So you can do all sorts of great statistical modeling. And Monte Carlo especially will give you a, and again, not a webinar, Monte Carlo, I'm sorry, if you know what it is, fantastic. Otherwise, just look it up. But Monte Carlo can give you a, a really good long tail, which you might say, I think it's going to cost me $100,000 for a cyber attack. But this Monte Carlo model says if everything goes wrong and the nth degree goes wrong, I'm up for Ten million dollars. I can't afford ten million dollars. My business isn't that big, so I might then start to say, "Well, I've either got to cut that off with risk treatments, or I've got to get insurance that might cap my amount. Maybe I can afford one hundred thousand dollars. I can't afford five hundred thousand. So that gives you information about where to to look at your um, cutoff point. Now, the next one's the law of the land. So this is really looking at um, you know areas where you can think about criminal data, but you can also think about competition. You know legitimate competition in the marketplace where people are trying to outmarket you and out there. But it all works largely with, within a legal framework, mostly. Okay, there's a few notable, you know, Enron being one classic example. But generally speaking, you, you can look at these and you can actually model it. You can historical data, you can look at what your competitors are doing, you can look at contract law as a defense in this. But now we look at this sort of law of the jungle type of approach where you and this is the this is the world of black swans, okay? all swans, all coloured swans. So this is where you have um, anything goes. You have an adaptive adversary who's using asymmetric tactics against you. You don't have a good data set. You know, this is where you're looking at maybe new evolving threats. You might be looking at use of AI for ransomware. You might be looking at terrorists and assaults, bomb attacks, these kind of things that are very uncommon, very unlikely. You, you really don't, you can't take them to court and sue them and have a nice little legal argument. You don't have any statistical models that you can rely on. So this is where you start looking at subject matter experts to, to work attack trees, to look at root cause, to look at causal chains, maybe Delphi technique and workshops to explore these ideas. So we've got, uh, yeah, well, I'll just keep going. I'll, I'll get you out of here within the hour. So I did say 12.30 to 1.30, maybe even a bit quicker. But let me have a look then at this uh, this idea of risks and an example. So going back to that service station we talked about where people would be doing armed robbery, you can think this is law of the land stuff. So you can use some historical criminal data. It's a little bit adversarial asymmetric, but you can apply the law of the land here. Equally, though, you've got the law of the jungle because you don't know, you know, as a, a boss of mine in the security business used to say, he said, he said, after 20 years in the business, he said, I know every trick in the book except the one they're using right now. And I think that's, that's you know, that's classic thinking about swans. We know pretty much all the things can go wrong, except the next thing that go wrong. So how do we anticipate it? So this is some of the techniques I use, and I'll rattle through these. So again, it's the same sort of thing. Likelihood can, can be informed by things like the demographics and the local data and what have you. And you can think about the inherent risk, depending where you are, you know, some parts of South America, maybe Afghanistan right now. 
it's it's not going to be the uh, a wonderful risk because the inherent risk is likely to be quite high and there may not be existing controls. So you can think about how we inform by threat assessments. So we can do we can look at how adequate are the existing controls, what are the historical events, etc. And this is one of the areas that I like to think about too. Is this P P10, P50, um, P90, and so that's a typo that. P5, P50, best case sort of thing. Actually, no, that's correct. There's a best case and a worst case. They're your outliers, okay? So if you think about 90% chance that these things will happen, start thinking about the worst and best case, which are 5% each. It's a little bit like the 80-20 rule, but here I'm just separating it out. And you could, depending on your level of uncertainty or your confidence with this, you might say, I've got a P95. You might say, I've got a, a P80 and it's, sort of 10% best case, 10% worst case, I don't know. But the important thing here is you're actually stating your level of uncertainty. So you're actually being able to say without, or maybe ideally with mathematical models, um, but as I said, you know, to three decimal places, be very skeptical of mathematical models. You just check those assumptions again and again because they will bite you. So if you look at this and then you start think, okay, let me put this in the framework of in this case an Ishikawa or a herringbone diagram and think, okay, networks are compromised by hackers. And, and this is only one example. There's any number, there's a bunch of examples. I'll give you a site where you can download a lot of these, the security risk management aid memoir. There's a couple of examples there. But the idea of red teaming is of building it and saying what could possibly go wrong. Now you could pick any one of these, okay? So you could pick um, I don't know, high staff turnover and explore that. And you could simply say, what does that do to my vulnerability? What happens if morale is high, morale is low? What happens if I have untrained staff because I'm turning them over two days? What happens if I can't get qualified staff? And so, you know, I'm simply doing it. So, so all of these things start to push your boundaries around the unexpected. And they start to hopefully get you thinking, you know, getting the budget holders thinking because you, know, you need to, persuade the people with the budget. If it's not used, someone has to spend the money and say, okay, if this is not addressed, here's our worst case scenario. Here's our swan, right? Here's our white swan. It's pretty obvious. We won't get the project done on time or we'll be, we won't be able to remediate this when we are compromised. Um, that's the white swan. The black swan is we don't have anybody because the staff are so pissed off because of the turnover and the conditions or we just can't recruit. So when we do get attacked, we have no recovery plan. We have no recovery staff. So that's kind of a very short way of, of you know, my, my idea about um, what do we do about black swans? Well, I think the first thing is you load up the shotgun and you get rid of it. You take them out of the vocabulary apart from, you know, something down the park that you can feed a bit of bread to and start to have a real big picture. Take the responsibility as risk managers to say, none of this should be a surprise. If you don't have a great imagination and you're, probably in the wrong business as a, a risk manager. I suspect most of us have pretty wild imaginations and to the point of being uh, accused of being wildly pessimistic or wildly optimistic, sometimes both. But for anyone who doesn't, it's just a matter of reading science fiction. And heck, you don't even need to read science fiction. You know, I was reading a, a Jack Carr novel recently with bioweapons and exploring those whole ideas of the what-if scenario, you know, how bioweapons might play out and be used against us. So. That's kind of it from me. Uh, I've got um, if those URLs are pretty small. I'd say I'll put this online as a video uh, on YouTube. So if you're not already subscribed to juliantalbot.com, uh, do or just jump on the website every now and again, have a look at that article that I wrote there. I will put a link to this there, but I'll also let you know by email. And some of these models have been put up at the SRMAM website. So that's the Security Risk Management Aid Memoir. They're free to download. Help yourself. Um, that's that's about it for me. That's 49 minutes. So I'm going to say thank you now. And I will turn off sharing and pull up the questions. So if anyone has any questions, now's the chance. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, lots of comments, loud and clear, good, thank you. Mark. Yep. 
yes, there will be a recording sent out. So um, how to perform bow tie diagrams. No, I don't think it's an industry standard for how to perform bow tie, gram, bow tie diagrams. There are a few pieces of software out there which are pretty good. I've got a, uh, I've got a few articles there and I've got a model. If, if there's enough interest, I'll do a seminar on it because bow ties have this wonderful graphic interface, but when you turn them 90 degrees into a table, they start to perform a really effective uh, causal chain analysis with a good credibility and links into why is this a risk and what am I doing about it and what are the actual controls? Not, not just this notional idea of, okay, we'll train more people, but the bow tie table then lets you say, okay, well, if I'm training them, to what standard, to what criteria, where are the records kept, are the records up to date? So it's a, it's a pretty robust. Um, so uh, Mark has said, uh, great beard, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, I did a walk recently in the Larapenta in um, Central Australia, and that was a, uh, 18 days in the bush, so I didn't shave, and uh, hence you have the Captain Ahab. The CPE points, I'm not sure, it's an ISRM, presentations so you might be able to as part of ISRM Institute of Strategic Risk Management on the ACD chair but uh, there's also an international body there uh, who else any questions uh, Jonathan said if it's 100% it's no longer a risk but a certainty I'd love to say yes to that but you know as you're saying life there's uh, only death and taxes and uh, I don't know if you if you look at how some of these corporations go. Even taxes are optional, so 100%. Um, <laughs> I don't know there's such thing, but yeah. Right. Hey, thanks, MJ. All right, everybody. If there's no more questions, I'm going to say uh, thank you very much for coming along, and uh, I'll close it off here. Please email me if you've got any questions or suggestions, or you would like to see any other topics covered or. More of that. That was pretty quick rattling through some of it. Um, thanks for coming along and nice to see so many people. Cheers. Bye.